All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for signing on. Sorry we got going a little bit late. There's a lot of people who are letting us know they're coming on a little early. We, I believe we got our camera on right now. I'm what Josh up? Douglas, my good buddy, Bassmaster Elite Series Pro, Seth Fighter. What's happening? Uh, we're going to lock this camera rock on here for just a little while, then we're going to shut it off for the presentation. If you're watching this on the recorded version on YouTube, I don't believe you'll be able to see the camera. Uh, but we'll turn it back on for questions at the end. Uh, but it, we are starting here with uh, finding bass in the grass. We appreciate everyone coming on. We have uh, quite a bit of attendees, so we appreciate that. We encourage everyone to ask questions. Uh, here yeah, we like questions, so bring them. We'll answer them. Well, we'll answer everything, and that's also how we get <laughs> ideas for upcoming webinars. Uh, we're going to keep these coming. This is our fourth one. They've been successful so far, and we're having a good time. And, uh, we, again, we appreciate everyone signing on. To ask questions right here, if you're, if you're looking at your, uh, you know, this is from a Mac, so I'm sure it's a little different on everyone else's computer, but just ask them here and we'll try to address them all at the end. If you're on the mobile app uh, for webinar, this is how you'd ask a question here. Um, we'd like to congratulate Jeff Nail. What up, Jeff? Congratulations, Jeff. You won our prize pack from our last, last webinar. We'll be contacting you to get a, a address put out. And again, we will be doing another uh, contest for this one we'll be picking someone at random who came on for the live feed and, and is on here currently i'd like to thank these these companies here biovex grapple pelican boxes and outcast tackle for their donations that they made uh, for our prize packs uh, i'm going to shut the camera off for now just in case we're blocking our screen all right We'll get started right away. We're going to talk about vegetation and finding bass in them and catching bass out of it. Um, one thing that everyone knows, I don't, you can be pretty elementary in the world of largemouth bass fishing, but one thing correlates pretty perfectly with largemouth, and that's weeds, vegetation, grass, whatever you call it. Uh, we kind of, you know, I don't know if it's scientifically or what, but they, they break down water vegetations, uh, aquatic vegetation, there are three different kinds. Yeah, emergent and floating we're going to discuss those as kind of one deal and we're going to break it down into more like fall fishing stuff so this could be hyacinth mats uh, arrowhead as you see here uh, any kind of emergent grass that's coming above and then we'll talk about more summer style fishing uh, and a lot of this has a little bit of overlap but we're trying to hit a general consensus here and we're talking about your submerged grasses like uh, coontail hydrilla milfoil milfoil the good stuff we'll get into all of it all right, first thing is we're going to get into summer fishing, more traditional, some offshore uh, grass fishing, weed lines, stuff like that. We might as well jump right into the goods. Yeah. Very um, first one, inside turns and points. Yeah, inside turns, real key spots in the weed lines in the summer. Uh, they're just as good as points. They probably don't get as much pressure or looked at as hard as points do. They don't tend to have hard bottom like uh, most of your points will, but... Um, a turn is still an ambush point for a fish just the same way as a point is and uh, a lot of them they can actually in the heat of the summer they can move up and down them a lot easier than they can points a lot of points tend to be flatter and a lot of those inside turns tend to have sharper breaks on them so those fish can slide up and down the break a lot easier um, in those summer months and they're real big players in the fall too as well I don't, I don't get on them much in the spring but um, definitely summer and definitely fall inside turns play a big deal. Yeah, a lot of times on those inside turns too, meaning that there's a point somewhere nearby, you get a little of that transition stuff, some sand, some gravel, little stuff like that on the edge of the weed line. Uh, one thing too, looking at this Navionic screenshot of one we picked out, uh, the red is obviously showing that inside weed line. And on the outside, you have two points and points are always good. Uh, inside weed lines are a little, you need your map to find those definitely, but Pay attention sometimes. A lot of the points that I like to fish aren't ones that the land up here doesn't necessarily show a point. You know, this one shows maybe a little bit of a kind of a point, but uh, there's a lot of, a lot of those things underwater you can only find with your Navionics mapping, and that'll help big time. Uh, here's a screenshot. This is from my Lowrance. Uh, like think Lowrance. All these screenshots come through uh, my Lowrance units. This is a traditional inside weed line. You can see here, you kind of got your point. You got some harder stuff out of the end of the point, and that's all good, all very good. And right here, you got your inside weed line. And you can see here kind of where I'm talking about these, these harder echoes, these whiter spots where that sand and gravel kind of turns into the into the weed line. And how would you fish something like that, Seth? Uh, that's jig worm and a wart for me pretty much nine times out of ten. Um, 
we'll get into the baits and stuff a little later, but uh, that jigworm is going to be a big player on a lot of the weed line stuff for me, especially where the grass is uh, sparser or on the edges. How would you approach something like this when you're fishing it? Um, I'd uh, If I knew there was fish here, I'd set my boat right about here and throw my jigworm right in this little fringe of grass right on that inside turn. Great spot for him to school up and jump out of the yeah. grass, jump on that jigworm. Flat spots. Yeah, flat spots on the points. This is another thing you can find on your Navionics map where you don't have to spend a lot of time looking. Um, these areas generally grow thicker weeds. Like um, if I'm flipping the grass, thicker, heavier vegetation. Um, these little flat spots on these points are key. There's a couple reasons why you're going to have harder bottom there. And by flat spot, I mean you can – you can see up here on the break, it drops real sharp offshore. And then out at the end of the point, it drops fairly quick again. And that little flat spot in there, the you know the right kind of milfoil is only going to grow in you know maybe eight to twelve feet essentially. So rather than just have a little strip of it along that point, you're going to actually have a thicker point of that grass where you know it's more places for them to hide in it and. Uh, Rather than just, you know, if you had straight contours all the way along there, you'd be dealing with a little strip. So, And the grass is going to grow a little thicker right there just because it is flat. Um, you get a sharp break, and, you know, grass, like I said, can only grow from certain depths. And if that depth range drops fairly fast, you're not going to have a lot of a lot of really thick grass there. And when you get those little flat spots like that, you're going to have a, a larger area of heavier vegetation. <clears throat> this is kind of a key point right here. This is This is – Ideally, a, a flat spot it has here. A lot of times up on top of them, them deals up in them flat spots, you can run into a little bit of a harder bottom area too. And a lot of that's key looking for, um, you know, your contour lines and stuff on your map. A lot of that will dictate. You can kind of guess where, where them harder areas will be. And you can see here as it slides up, it's a little bit uh, split up here. And then you get up, it gets real dense, real dark. And this is even earlier in the year. A lot of times you want this stuff to be topped out up to the top surface even thicker than this but you can tell i mean this this we've both been traveling so much um which by the way congratulations on your fast master elite top 12 thank you for in it thank very you. first one yeah you're doing news. good work in the opens this year too yeah, yeah come gotta, join me next year you gotta keep her going i appreciate that though but uh all good stuff uh but this was done earlier we would have liked to been able to get out and try to get this deal uh but uh to show you even more topped up we can get the idea give this another month to grow and that grass gets really, really thick up top there. Uh, this is a great example. A lot of people ask me, I'm doing electronics training about rocks and gravel and stuff in grass. That's hugely important from Florida to Minnesota, wherever you go, any kind of bottom change in there. A lot of times we've talked about so many in our, so many times in our other webinars, especially finding hard bottoms and stuff like that. You look at the map to find any kind of contour change. Anything that's, that hasn't flattened has got to have something that's somewhat hard there. And, uh, yes, you can actually see the rocks. You can see each one. And here you see how white that feedback gets as we went over the top. And that, that's a perfect, pretty ideal, uh, something you're going to find on those high spots. That is a fine-looking right spot. They're in there. Yeah, they are. Ditches, intersections, and neck downs. Yep. Um, anytime I go to a lake I've never been to before, um, these are definitely key areas you want to look at, um, especially in that – post-spawn early summer and then late summer early fall anytime you got fish on the move they're going to use these uh i mean i guess uh ditches to travel from you know shallower bays out to main lake stuff and vice versa and uh another key thing about these a lot a lot of the stuff we do up here is all natural lakes and we really don't have any current um you'll get current generated in here just by the wind blowing or maybe boat traffic, stuff like that. Um, real key areas. Any, anytime there's a neck down in a natural lake, that's an area I'm going to spend a lot of time in um, just for the purposes. Bass are traveling through it, and uh, there's going to be more current there than you'll find anywhere else in a natural lake. Um, really good areas to look at. It's going to be more like jigworm stuff, maybe a little bit of flipping, but uh, just real high percentage areas. I mean, you're basically just getting on a bass trail and the fish will funnel in and out of there uh, as the day goes on or the seasons change. They're just real high percentage spots to look at. And and things like this, too, these canals and stuff, I find these to be – the fish to be a little bit more active. You can get a lot closer to them. They're kind of easier to catch. They're used to boat traffic. There's always boat traffic running in and out of there. They're used to them, and it keeps the, the bluegills, the crayfish, stuff like that. It keeps them really moving 
in those areas. And I think it just keeps, these are feeding stations for these fish to really move in and, and eat. Definitely. Poles in the grass. I mean, this is a big one. You can find a lot of this kind of stuff, fish in these types of, of areas, these sand spots. Um, they can range from shallow to deep, really. Yeah. Yeah. Any of that kind of stuff is good. This shows you it pretty perfectly. Uh, wide open, kind of little sandy areas. Actually, a little bit. There's a couple little rocks, stuff like that in there. But uh, this is a great area. Those bluegills will stack in there pretty good. And you can fish some grass lines and stuff like that in these in these canals. A lot of below areas, too, from where the boats jump up and sit back down. Kind of keeps the grass a little cleaner in those areas in those canals. Anything on here? That's a good-looking spot. Steep shoreline breaks. Steep shoreline breaks. Uh, these are anytime I go to a lake that I've never fished before. Uh, I can almost guarantee you the steepest break on the lake will have fish on it. This is a smallmouth, largemouth, same deal. The big um, ones too. Yeah, big, big fish. fish late spot. summer. This isn't this isn't typically good in the spring. Um, the heat of the summer really good. Same deal with the inside turn. It's just they can move up and down that break really easy, and you know if it gets a little hot, they can slide out a little deeper into the thicker grass or vice versa and uh these spots actually play a lot in the in the fall too as well um fish will get on that really well um like i said though the the sharpest break on the in any natural lake you go to will have fish on it um these are definitely things i look for in lakes i've never been to before real high percentage spot for me yeah they'll also go into the fall which we're going to kind of get into next is going to be more your shallow fall fishing but it definitely starts in the summer, but you you can still definitely catch some of your bigger fish on these things, uh, on these start these steep breaks, well into the fall, pretty good. We had comments, text messages about the Tonka Customs hat. There you go. Thank you. All right. I didn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. All right. Let's talk about setups. Let's get let's get into okay. some fun stuff, man. Yeah. How, how, how are you catching them? Okay, um, a lot of that outside edge stuff, um, a lot of this is dictated too by on conditions. Um, if I get a cloudy, I, I, ideal conditions for me fishing grass are glass, calm, and sunny. But, uh, I mean, those fish definitely don't vacate just because it's not perfectly nice out. Uh, anytime I get a little bit of wind or a fair amount of wind and some cloud cover, that storm wiggle wart is an awesome bait to throw on weed lines. You can rip it through the grass really well catch a lot of fish on. I don't know how much money's been won on Lake Minnetonka on a wiggle wart, but it's a lot. Um, I throw it on a Daiwa 7.7 medium moderate action rod. Um, I usually use a glass composite rod for most of my cranking, but this type of cranking, we're actually ripping it through the weeds. So I use a little faster action rod or stiffer rod, I should say. Uh, 6.3 to gear one gear ratio Daiwa reel and 12 pound fluorocarbon. Uh, I used to use 10, but uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed lately the zebra mussels are growing all over the milfoil out there. So I had to step the line up a little bit. I was breaking off a couple of crankbaits, just getting That's them all in the over grass. the country, too. Yeah. We're seeing those zebra mussels from New York to Minnesota. I mean, Yeah, everywhere. zebra mussels are definitely changing the grass lakes. We used to, I mean, even our jig worms, we used to be able to throw eight-pound tests. And now we're uh, definitely on game day, we're bumping her up to 12 pounds. Just them big ones get you in the grass, and they'll saw you off on that. And then – uh Back to a, just a plain Texas rig, pretty simple stuff. Um, got a new bait out from Dio, a Dio rattling tube hog. Um, I know a lot of guys are familiar with the tube craw. It's similar, but it's a little finessier version. It actually has a rattle built into the bait. Um, been a really killer bait for us this year. Um, but a Texas rig is great to fish in the grass from, you know, 15 feet up to a foot of water. It's, it's weedless. It slides through the stuff nice. Um, you catch a ton of fish on it. It's definitely a, a really good numbers bait. Um, another tip I'll give you guys, uh, I, I've, I've gone down to 30-pound braid. Um, I know a lot of guys flip with 70, 65. Some guys go to 50. But um, I've never – I haven't had any problems breaking the line. So the 30-pound didn't scare me at all. And the, actually the thinner diameter um, cuts through the grass better. I mean, it's a no-stretch line just like all your braids. But uh, the fact that it's half the diameter of, you know, 65-pound braid, uh, I mean, I literally saw reeds right in half with that 30-pound stuff. And I think I'm getting more bites now because of it, too. Right on, man. <clears throat> Same type of deals here when we're, when we're uh, fishing some of this offshore stuff. Man, it seems like I'm a lot of times 
polar opposite than what I prefer to have in my hand. I either want a big flipping stick and big jig and uh, flipping kind of those high spots that we talked about, those good milfoil, then steep breaks, stuff like that. Or I like a finesse rod and, and I like the jig more. Uh, in this case, I, I'm using a custom custom built MHX 885, FP 885 flipping stick. Uh, that's on a Daiwa Zillin. 7 3 to 1 gear ratio reel, sweet. I put on 70 pound Daiwa Samurai braid. It's super quiet. Once you go to that braid, you really won't ever look away from it. It's, it's so quiet. I, I can guarantee I've gotten started fishing that this January and I've caught more big fish this year than I have in any of the other years when it comes to heavy flipping and I mean, true, like seven, eight, nine pound fish. And I really think I hadn't changed much, but, but the braid. Um, and then this one, I got an RTX jig, um, RTX three quarter, one ounce. A lot of times I like that fast drop. Some people like the half ounce and, and there's a time and a place I like half ounce too, but you know, uh, Kevin Van Dam is one of the best fishermen on the planet because he knows how to get fish to bite out of pure reaction. And I think that's something that you get out of a three-quarter or a one-ounce jig is, is that bait falls and hits that fish in the face so fast that they don't even think about it. They just open their mouth and eat it. And once you start getting that, a lot of times we can get those schools going, pull 20 fish out of a school, um, you know, once you get that first one to bite. So I, a lot of times I prefer a heavier jig, ounce, three-quarter ounce, something like that. My spinning rod is up. Oh, oh, good. I have one thing I want to add. Uh, I flip a jig a lot too in the grass on a Texas rig. That that jig will definitely get you bigger bites. Uh, no doubt about, about it. it. You're gonna catch more numbers flipping a Texas rig, but um, I've caught a lot more five pounders on a jig than I have on a Texas rig in the grass. Even with so. the even with the punch skirt. Sometimes yeah, it yeah. Seems like the jig just something gets about that. it. Big profile looks like a big bluegill to him. It, it it will catch the biggest fish out of the school hands down. Definitely will. Team tournaments, one should always have a Texas rig clip and one should always have a jig on. Yeah, it. that's how we roll. Yeah. Uh, my spinning rod, my, one of my favorites, this is a MHX high module SJ812 spinning rod. Uh, here I'm using a Daiwa uh, Procyon spinning reel. Uh, it's a 3000 size. Uh, it's real strong reel, great for when they get in the grass. I can just kind of muscle them down, turn that drag down, and just use the braid to get them out. I'm using 10 pound Daiwa Steez. And uh, or, or a 10 pound Daiwa J braid is my, my main line, and then I'm using a 10 pound Daiwa Steez floral carbon leader. And my my out, my jig worm setup it, it varies a little bit, but here I got a chartreuse outcast money jig, and I got a little uh, three inch BioVex green pumpkin colt tail killer little bait, and just set her in the grass, and wait for one to pick it up. Beautiful setup. Now we get into the fun, fun stuff, too. Yeah. I, as much as I like the other grass, I really like this kind of grass, too. I, I probably, at any given day, couldn't tell you which one I'd prefer. Um, but we're, we're going to include emergent and floating together because, in my book, it's kind of all the same. Shallow fishing. Um, you know, this is great. This is great in the uh, fall time, especially up north. We talk about it more fall because, you know, we still we don't have grass here in the spring for it. When they're up on the flats, our grass is really not that existent. So, uh, big time fall those fish definitely those first couple cold nights yeah. and they go shallow quick. yeah it doesn't take much up here in uh minnesota just some even if it's still hot during the day the first few nights where we get down into the 40s and 50s you're gonna see a push of fish go shallow it doesn't matter if it's 80 degrees in the day it might still be in august but the first couple cold nights you're gonna see some fish go shallow it's just it happens every single year out here um great way to catch some really big fish too that time of year yeah and, and it'll get better and better literally by the day it seems like they just start rolling in there in big numbers uh you know this is a great thing uh navionics obviously a lot of times we show up to lakes we've never been to before and a little little you know checking it out beforehand whether it's the night before in the hotel a month before whatever even right when you launch just kind of looking for the flats looking for these areas that you know are going to be good areas and then just looking it'll tell you right there if it's got heavy vegetation or emergence emergent whatever it's got yeah. and and google earth that'll, obviously is always another good thing too yeah, they'll save you a lot of time there's a lot of stuff on those navionics cards that you can i mean you can know about the lake before you even put your boat in the water so just pay attention to those little things if you got the card it, there's a lot of stuff on there it will show you i mean you can look at an area and think it might have grass but if you go in there and look at it and it says it has grass it's it's probably got grass, and it would be a good place to start looking. It's definitely there. Uh, shallow flats. No doubt about it, shallow flats are real key in the fall time. Um, it's the dinner table. That's where all the bluegills, yep. it's where the crayas, where everything is going to go. 
uh, the pike, the musky, everything will move in there, and uh, the bass move in big time. For sure. Great place to look in the fall. Um, every lake's got them. They might be the same areas they spawn in the spring, um, but definitely in the fall, something about those shallow flats, just all the bait gets on them, and uh, like anything, the big bass follow them up there, and they usually got a bunch of really thick grass on them, shallower, but um, plenty of cover and plenty of great spots for them to hide. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, matted vegetation. It's easily one of my favorite. A lot of things are dying yeah, that by time far of year. My favorite. A lot of hyacinth mats all across the country. Um, it can be any kind of really floating vegetation and anything. Those mats are great. Sometimes, especially in the fall time, it, you know, you pull up to the right kind of mat and you can flip, you can make four flips and catch four equally sized big bass that just all kind of sit underneath that mat. Um, a lot. One thing about shallow fishing and even grass fishing in general we do use you a lot of people know i'm an electronics guy i really like to use my electronics a lot and i do still sometimes with grass not really with shallow mostly everything's visual at that point um you're kind of getting in there and you're using your eyes you kind of can go away from your electronics a little bit and uh and, and just get out there and just just use your nose and sniff them out find that best kind of grass and stuff so there's really not a whole lot of screenshots outside of us just Look at that. I, I'd say app. pay a little attention to the depth. If you're in areas that have a ton of matted up, I mean, it's different if you go in there and there's just one little mat or something, you know, that's the place to be. But um, if you're in areas that are expansive and all of it's, say, two foot deep and there's like a 10 yard section that might be two and a half foot deep, that'd be a key area to look at. Um, creek, the little creek channels yeah. and stuff that run in and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, so just keep a little eye on your depth finder, but most of it's pretty much 90% visual. You're just looking for the thickest, nastiest stuff you can find. It'll actually make it. Sometimes you get those little ditches that run in there, and they'll make little weed lines almost within their little areas you can go through, and maybe those outside pads have a little bit more depth on them, uh, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and pads, I mean, if you really pay attention to pads, they'll actually read just like a lake map. Um, like, you know, the deeper ones will lay nice and flat on the water. And then you see where they start to curl up a little bit. You know, it's a little bit shallower there. Um, Especially but, as the water drops. Yeah, the any, anytime you get shallow, if, if you pay attention to your surroundings, you can actually read the grass like a lake map once you've spent some time there. You know, you know, certain kind of grasses are just going to grow and say that three to four feet of water. And like I said with the pads, like the deeper pads are going to lay nice and flat on the surface. And as it starts to get shallow, you know, they get not enough water on, they'll start to curl up and you can actually – follow that edge of curled up pads and it, it's essentially a topographical map that you can look at visually with your eyes and one thing about these mats is so important um from florida to minnesota it really doesn't matter uh these are heat sources for these fish too and they can get underneath them yeah uh, a lot of times they're in these flats because it's starting to get cold things are starting to change in the fall and the main lakes start to shut down a little bit and these fish go in into these flats where come afternoon same as in spring it's going to warm up again and in this particular hyacinth mat, you can see it's a junk mat all around. It's like a perfect, that's like perfect mat, actually. It's got like a bunch of junk floating bog kind of all around it. And then it's just got like that sweet spot right in the middle. And that right there, that'll retain heat big time. A lot of times I, I'm more successful if it is a cold fall or a cold day you're fishing. Sun comes out about, you know, NFL kickoff time, noon, one, two o'clock. That's when the fishing really starts to heat up. This, this mat right here will bake in the sun. And depending, let's say there's, you know, if there's a foot or two underneath there, you just punch right in there and they're going to grab it but let's say there's five feet underneath there a lot of times these fish actually put their backs up into that muddy part and get up there because that is getting warmer and they can sit right in that little deal and so when i lift i'll lift my weight up my tungsten weight up and kind of jiggle it in the top of the mat and that's a lot of times when i'll get them bites on them really really cold days for sure you can think of grass as insulation either way you know in the cold day in the spring it's going to hold heat and uh in the hot of the summer, it's going to be a little cooler in the middle of that vegetation. And back in the fall again, once stuff starts cooling down, um, you know, it's going to be a little warmer in that grass. It's, it's just like having insulation in your house. It, it, if it's hot, it'll keep it cooler. And if it's cold, it'll stay a little warmer in there. Uh, when we're talking about visually and you're visually looking for different things, there, there is some different vegetations and stuff that tend to tend to hold uh, more fish. And a lot of times these vegetations also tell you what the bottom's made out of. Um, you know, arrowhead, stuff like that, eelgrass or, or uh, deer tongue, those things like sand, you know, they kind of grow yeah. in more sand and, and that area might get a little bit warmer for them and, and they're just a little bit better areas. And this 
particular instance, you know, we're talking about reeds, bullwhips, and cattails. These are all your emergent type vegetation, all very good. Um, yeah. Uh, lily pads, arrowhead, wild rice is big up here in northern Minnesota. We got a lot of wild rice, probably very. I would say roughly the same as what Kissimmee grass would probably be to like Real in the south. I mean, same type of idea. Uh, you can see it here. You got all that arrowhead in the back. So this is going to be a sandier area out in front of it. Um, again, those lily pads. And, and even as those lily pads start to die off later into the fall, them roots are still real good and real strong. And a lot of times you can just run around. They, they kind of make like a little, you know, they come out in little clumps. And so you got that little area for that, for that four or five pound bass just to sit in. And you throw a jig right there and, It'll erupt. And then grass. Grass is still the same. Shallow. Uh, shallow clumps of grass are real good. Uh, pepper grass, hydrilla, milfoil, eelgrass, all things we're visually looking for in the water uh, while we're running around and, and trying to fish a flat. Yeah. And there's a couple of things. You got uh, certain types of grasses that will like, get in and certain types of grasses will be around. Um, I'd say milfoil is by far my favorite grass to fish if I can find it in the lake. Um, but fish will use different types of grass differently. Like if you have milfoil, them fish are going to be right in it. It's just the way it grows. Um, you know, the bottom, the bottoms of the milfoil plant don't really grow any leaves. So it almost creates like a cavern underneath there where, uh, grass like coontail or hydrilla is real similar. It grows solid, like all the way to the bottom. Those are kind of grasses. They just kind of get around where you do better on the edges of them. But uh, milfoil, if I if I can find it, I'm gonna fish it, and they usually get right in the thickest part of it they can, just because, like I said, there is actually a cavern underneath there where they can swim around and move around easily, and you know, ambush bluegills and stuff inside of there. And that seems to be all kind of from from what I've seen all across the country, whether it's Eurasian milfoil or regular northern milfoil. There's a few different strains, but all holds pretty equal. <clears throat> okay, you when you go going shallow. shallow um you got the same taxes rig again this is a lot of this is gonna weight's gonna be a big part of this um i'm flipping anything from probably a three ace to an ounce and a half just depending on vegetation and then uh i like to throw a frog a lot in the fall when these fish get shallow really good bluegill imitator i, I think especially up here nine times out of ten when a fish eats your frog he's they're usually eating bluegills more so than actually eating frogs and I think it's one of the best representations for a bluegill up shallow. Um, and I throw it on 50-pound braid, cast really nice, 7.2, medium heavy extra fast rod, 7.3 ro uh, gear ratio reel. Um, really great way to catch some big fish and cover a lot of water too. And there's a lot of areas like in the fall when you get into these flats where um, flipping just, you know, the grass is so thick, you, the only thing you can really flip is the edge. And with that frog, I can throw that, you know, 50 yards way up into a grass mat and still get a bite and pull it out of there where flipping you just you can't properly fish a bait with that much line out when you're doing that so really good way to target bass you can't get any other bait too yeah and, and a frog uh, you know one thing that some of the smaller little lakes I, I grew up fishing around here in minnesota and it's it's held up so much all around the country is that frog can get shallower than i can so some of the biggest fish that i've seen here in minnesota and in like New York, places like that, uh, when I was living in Chickamauga, th those big, big fish will go up way dirt shallow. Like you'd think their fins are out of the water back on like a mat or something way, way back there. I physically can't get my boat. But being able to make a 50-yard cast with a frog, I can throw that thing all the way up on the bank and take two twitches off. And, and sometimes that's when you catch those really big ones. Uh, my setups, I actually see a mistake on it that I didn't, I failed to fix. But um I am using a Daiwa 812. It's got a real fast tip. I'm sorry, a, a MHX 812 casting rod. Uh, it's got a real fast tip, and I'm, I'm throwing a, a weight bait. Weight baits are great, topwater baits. Uh, topwater in general is real good, but this one seems to be good in like uh, this, these types of natural lakes, shallow, shallow fishing. Yeah. I've done well on wake baits inside grass lines early in the fall, like when we were talking about the first few cold nights when the fish move up shallow. If you get a, a nice sandy, hard cut inside grass line, a LL wake bait's a good bait to throw. Get a big bite. Get yeah. a big bite. Uh, throwing that on a Daiwa Zillion, fast gear ratio, seven speed. I'm using 30-pound Daiwa J-Braid with 15-pound Daiwa Steve's fluorocarbon leader. Uh, and then that's the BioVex wake bait, great wake baits, heavy. I can cast it a long ways. 
Uh, got really good top water action. Uh, and then I'm also throwing a swim jig. Okay, it's pro swim jig. I, I'm telling you, it's one of my baits I have everywhere I go. I, I love throwing a swim jig. They just get bit. They're numbers one in a big fish bait. Uh, I'm throwing on an MHX HM873 that I built. It's a good one, seven foot three inches, medium heavy action. I can cast it a far away. And I used to use a heavy action. I thought I liked it because a lot of my, most all of my jig fishing outside of that, I use a heavy action. But uh, I like that medium heavy better. Um, it keeps them hooked up. I had a problem, you know, where they bite it and I feel it and I get that hook set and then they make one jump and just throw it. And it seems like this medium heavy keeps them, keeps them pegged through that. And a little I keep softer tip too. Softer. Right. Yep. Probably yep. lets yep. them get the bait a little bit better. Yeah. And, and sometimes depends on what I'm fishing, uh, will dictate whether I'm going to use fluorocarbon or I'm going to use, um, braid. If I'm fishing like in heavy stuff, throwing it up into thick lily pads and stuff like that, where. I'm not so much worried about working it through. I'm worried about when it bites, can I get it? Can I physically get them fish out of there? If I feel like I can, then I'm going to go with fluorocarbon. Uh, I use 16-pound Daiwa Steez fluorocarbon, and this is an Outcast, Outcast uh, Pro Swim Jig, and I'm usually throwing the quarter ounce, or the three-eighths ounce with any kind of grub imitator or, or, or a paddle tail swim bait. You just got to kind of dictate where you're at and what the fish are chasing. But big-time bluegill imitator. Uh, bass around here definitely eat bluegills and, and i can th i can literally throw that swim jig anywhere and same with like seth the time with, with the frog i can i can move a lot of water with that swim jig i, I can cover a lot and, and once i key in on them if i gotta slow down start flipping them up and then, or throwing a senko around then that's what i'll do all right we jammed right through that one yeah we got a lot of questions and i know we've had a lot of them coming in and i've had some previous ones people want more specific coontail type stuff i'm getting coming in um, but first of all, this, this webinar was recorded, uh, like all of them are. We appreciate those that come on and watch it live. That have, obviously helps us, and we uh, give away prize packs, and we'll notify the winners at the next one from this one. Uh, but here's our three previous ones we started with, and they're all available on, on my, uh, my, my YouTube channel, and they'll soon be available on both of our websites once we get that going. We need, we need the fishing to slow down just a little bit for us to get to some stuff like that, but it'll all be out there. Uh, our next webinar, we got to put it out just a little bit. We both have very hectic fishing schedules coming up. Um, going to be on separate sides of the country and then rotate. Our next one will be October 12th, which will be perfect time to talk about Fall River Bassin. Awesome yeah. time of year to be fishing Great river systems. Fish. Bunch up. We'll talk about both small Everybody's mode. hunting and the big yeah. ones are bite. Yeah, they are. And I love that time of year. Uh, keep the bibs on all day and go and catch them. Uh, we'll talk about some smallmouth, some current stuff, and we'll also talk about largemouth getting back into some of the sloughs and stuff like that on those rivers and those little more slack areas. Those both schools, both both largemouth and smallmouth school up big time, and it's fun. We're hoping to get down there beforehand for sure. We'll we'll do our we'll do our part. Make yeah. sure we get our. Let's content. get us some questions. That's my favorite part of the show. Uh, real quick, real quick before we get to that, thank you. Navionics supports this. Um, they, they, they fund this and allow us to be able to get this out and be able to do this for everybody. And then I'd like to thank uh, Psycho Bass Monkey. Awesome, awesome deal, awesome website, awesome dude. Todd's running around doing big things for the sport, and yeah. uh, he, he's Check great to us, promotes us, and thank you. Same with Ricky and Bass East. Yeah. Awesome sites, classic bass. We appreciate everything they're doing, kind of a Minnesota company that we're starting to see. We're trying to get out there. And then Dr. Sonar, I learned so much stuff from him. And uh, – grown into this and, and he supports us to this day so any emails anything you want uh sign up for our next one there and then please there's our email address send over anything you have let's roll with the question i'm gonna turn the camera on Damn. Damn. all right let's stop it i think so wade asks grass in eight to twelve feet of water about three to five foot below the surface how do i dissect it and find bass quick um if you do get those cloudy, windy days, great place to throw a wart. Um, you know, if I'm going to flip grass, that's that's my favorite way to pick it apart. I'm looking for grass that's almost to the surface, you know, kind of right on that edge where it starts fading off. Probably Hard a little, to run a crankbait through. A little more than, you know, closer to the surface than three to five foot below. Um, but if it's sparse, that jig worms, killer, killer bait. But, uh. Uh, like I said, if you got a cloudy, windy day, reaction baits over the top of it. Um, if not, I just like going down it and punching a jig or a Texas rig every 10 feet through it. Right on. Richard, Richard asks, uh, 
I love these questions, man. I don't know. I've never been to Lake Murray. He said, uh, if you were fishing Lake Murray in late September, what would you use? It's a good question. I will tell you one thing we didn't talk about. Lake Murray down there, we're starting to talk about shad and stuff. So I, I would definitely say like it's a, a blue bag. Uh, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So any kind of top water baits. Call Casey Ashley. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, 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 we've never been there. We've never been there in the fall. But thanks so, for the question. Uh, I definitely. wish I had a better answer for you. Hopefully but, soon. I'm sure we'll uh, I mean, soon. if it's in September, I'm sure a top water plug will work pretty good. Um, maybe a fluke, something like that. Some of those, they start fishing a little tough and grimy this time of year. Yeah. So you might need to get a shaky head Shake your head, head wacky Sanko. Like All right, Adam Bartushek. Our guy, yes. Uh, does this grass graphing correlate to the river river well? For example, understand what I'm looking for in terms of foil on lakes like Tonka, but down past pools four through eight, what types of grass and depths are you really looking for? Is this yeah. more backwaters or transition areas? Oh, uh, on rivers like that, you're not going to get a lot of deep grass like we're talking about when we talk about Lake Minnetonka. It's going to be shallow stuff. You're pretty much just going to be throwing a a swim jig around it or a frog, frog over the top time. of it frogs killer on the river so is a swim jig um but yeah you're you're just you're not going to get the right kind of grass to like deep weed line grass stuff it's it's going to be a power fisherman's deal and yeah um that shallow graph and it's not going to be a big deal it's going to be real visual for you mm -hmm. um crank the trolling motor up sling that frog around and cover some water is my best advice for you um one thing too about the grass on i have done well in the fall with like a spook water bait i know rapples got a new top water uh walk the dog style bait that would work great down there yes a lot of times that hydrilla does there is a lot of or not hydr hydrilla coontail sorry a lot of coontail that grows back in the backwater areas and you get a little current going over the top and a little bit of water where you can where you can pull some top water you got little sand spots and stuff uh top water is also a, a key bait and one we didn't we didn't put on there a buzz bait is one of my favorite baits yeah. in the fall and buzz i don't even think killer. we talked about that but i mean coast to coast that Bla black buzz, buzz bait, bait yes. gold blade baggins in the fall big ones baggins uh, let's see michael do you let the type of day overcast sunny dictate your bait color like watercolor will um most of our grass fishing is done in fairly clear water I, I love green pumpkin like can't get enough of it um the conditions aren't necessarily going to change my bait color but it's going to change where i fish and how i fish um i try to avoid like uh windier sections of the lake when i'm grass fishing but if you get a real windy day, it's unavoidable. That's where that crankbait's really going to play. A lot of times those fish sit up on top. Of yeah. They scatter more and they get up more on top of the grass. Not Especially so, with the clouds yeah. and the wind. That, that wiggle wart's a big deal when you get those kind of conditions. Um, Color-wise, I, I don't really – I'm, I'm going to base that more on water clarity rather than sun Absolutely. versus clouds. And, like, I mean, green pumpkin, you just yeah, when can't it does, go wrong just, just with it. Same with the shallow deal, too. Uh a lot of times those those windy, cloudy, rainy days are great frogging days, great swim jig. You you can move yeah. water. They're they're moving away from what they're using to protect. Essentially, they get in that clump to keep something over their head and and to hide and to ambush something. So they they feel a little of those overcast days. Same as the deeper grass, like they can scatter a bit more. They can get away from that. So a lot of times that's when the swim jig and frog a buzz bait would be a really good one. Those baits will really shine that time. Bob, are you using a leader on your braid? Or does the grass hide the braid enough where you can tie direct? That depends. That's a good question. That's, That's good basically going to be dictated by the density of your vegetation. Um, if you're flipping really thick grass, I don't think you need a leader. Um, I will fish a leader on some stuff that's a little sparser. Um, tie an FG knot for sure. Um, look that one up if you can. By far the best line to leader knot if you are going to tie a leader. FG knot. Look it up on YouTube um but yeah i'm kind of one or the other with it really I, I will use a leader a little bit but um on our spinning poles most always yeah braid we always have a leader on spinning there. pole for sure that you're fishing you know less dense vegetation but the really really thick stuff just straight straight braid and just right. rip them out and don't worry about it uh jason asks is your weight pegged ah uh, good question i was going to go over that yes weight is pegged every single time I have a story to tell you about this. I ran out of, we use bobber stops. 
or rubber bobber stops. I've never used them for actually bobber stopping, yeah, but right, actually. you can get them yeah. anywhere. They're <laughs> super cheap rubber bobber stops. You slide them on your line. Only way to peg it. Um, I actually was out on Minnetonka flipping, practicing for a tournament, ran out of bobber stops and tried to use a unpegged sinker and literally never had a bite on it. I had to start flipping a jig. Um, that something about it they don't like it if you're fishing open water open cover you can get by without pegging it but and sometimes it's even i've seen a little bit in open more open water open cover where sometimes you might even get it's a little bit different presentation yeah you slide oh, that peg definitely up or open water but if you're in there flipping the grass you have to have to have your weight pegged yeah even if you're to flip a mat you didn't have it i've heard i've heard guys that don't and all that and, and teach their own but a lot of times, if, if mine even slides down a little bit, maybe I caught a fish, I forgot to slide it back down. That weight will throw, will fall in, but that, that my bait will stay up in the mat, won't even actually fall through. You want that nice slick deal. Uh, same question, tip floral leader, yes. Uh, how high is the best grass, has Raymond? Um, Sometimes really high, man. Sometimes floating. Uh, my opinion is the tallest thickest vegetation you can find is the best um that's going to be different on every lake of the right yeah and of the right i'm talking right milfoil, yeah, milfoil yeah, now right. like flipping milfoil the tallest thickest grass now you know if you're in 12 foot of water and the grass comes up a foot below the surface that's going to be taller than grass in eight feet of water that's to the surface so i mean you kind of got to feel that out on each lake, but uh, I mean, if you're asking for our home lakes, our best milfoil grows in eight to ten, twelve feet With of water. water clarity changes a little bit. Very Basically, very when I'm flipping that edge, I'm looking for you know you have the grass from the bank out grow pretty much up to the surface, right where that grass kind of quits growing to the surface, kind of starts to dip down. This might be you know eight to twelve feet um that's where i'm that's that edge i'm going to kind of follow as i'm flipping through there but uh basically the tallest thickest grass you can find is the best uh michael's asking do you try to stay with as light a weight as possible or do you start with a one to two months to make sure you get through I, i'd say you know when it comes to like that heaviest stuff which we're probably talking about like flipping uh matted vegetation a lot of times, I'm, it depends. If we're talking about what what the vegetation is, if we're talking about mass, I'll probably start with like a one and a half, and even try to work myself a little bit down if I can. Matter of fact, I remember when we were both down in Florida this year, you threw me that little tip that one and a quarter was getting yeah. a bit more so than one and a half. Um, yeah, I mean the lightest weight as possible is. I, I want it to go through every at right least away. nine out of ten flips. When you're flipping mats, if you have to shake your bait to get it to go through, you pretty much lost all of your reaction bite. I don't hardly ever get bait if I have to shake my bait to get it to go through. Um, you want it to just shoot through and slip through every time. I mean, that doesn't mean I'm going to flip a two ounce sinker and really sparse stuff, but um, as light as weight as you can get, a, or light as weight as possible that you can get away with. But I want to go through at least nine out of ten times without having to shake my bait uh, when you're punching mats, anyways. And without, really, I mean, I've seen everyone doing the throw it up in the air, and you know, I'm guilty of even doing that sometimes too, and it makes it for a fast entry. But really, I mean, these big fish get big for a reason, and and as silent, and you know, I remember watching in Chickamauga where those where those bluegills would hop up on the top, they'd get flushed out of the grass, and they'd hop up on top of the mat, and they'd sit there for 30 seconds and literally not move, just on their side for 30 seconds. And then all of a sudden they'd slip back through. But when they did, it's like watching deer run through the thickest part of the woods. You barely even hear them or see anything. They just disappear. And those big fish know that the bait, the, 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 what they're trying to eat, them big splashes. Try Anytime you're fishing shallow, really you want as quiet of the entry as you can get. So there's like that perfect weight-wise that it's still, you know, you're not having too big of a splash or too big of a commotion going in. And your bait is still falling through relatively quick. Uh, what going. methods, Aaron asks, what methods do you use to combat zebes, zebra mussels, especially cranking? Do you ever use any leader material than floral? I don't. Uh, I still use floral. For yeah, when I'm part. cranking, I got straight floral to the, uh, all the way from my bait to the rod. If you got to go with a floral carbon, you just have a braid for flipping or a jigworm or something, you just got to, you just got to go bigger floral, yeah, you know? You you, you, and you retie, retie, yeah, retie. I'm telling you, make a little longer um, leader so you can keep chopping it down, but. 
I mean, that's something that I get better at every tournament, it seems. I'm constantly checking my line. Yeah, yeah, every time. There's just hooks and line and everything. You just want to stay on top of that kind of stuff. And it, it yeah. takes it takes 20 seconds to retie real quick and, and you're back fishing. And that's what you got to do. Yeah. A lot of times, as long as you do that, you'll get the fish in the boat. Yeah. And like I said, just step that line up a little bit. Like normally I would have cranked with 10. Now I'm cranking with 12. And who knows, a year from now, we'll probably be cranking with 15. And that's just... That's just been the natural progression of the zebra mussels. Jeff, where are the bass usually located under the grass? On the bottom or right under the tops? Uh, that's going to vary. Maybe, yeah. I mean, typically closer to the bottom, but if you're fishing real shallow mats and you get like a cold day and it's really calm and sunny, um, they're going to get up there and try to get as close to that sunlight as they can, try to absorb a little heat out of it. But, uh, I mean, that's going to vary by the day what about like, like we 10 said. foot i think like 10 yeah foot 10 foil, 12 you know? foot typically going to be on the bottom you get a windy cloudy day those fish will sit a, lot, a little higher in the grass um but most most of your fish are especially we do a lot of milfoil fishing up here so i mean like i said there's kind of like a canopy and like a little cavern underneath so most of your fish are going to be pretty close to the bottom but that's kind of dictated by uh conditions and, and and i think how many are there you know sometimes you look at like a bass pro tank and you'll see like most of them on the bottom then maybe one's hanging here one's hanging here and it ain't nothing for sometimes you get out of the right school of the grass like one thing i'll tell people during electronics training i should tell everybody is when you're flipping grass when you when you're going through and you're just randomly flipping cause a lot of times you just gotta you just gotta go to work man you gotta take a flipping rod and you gotta pick the right grass and you just gotta go flipping until you get bit but as soon as you get bit I remember I used to kick a buoy off the side of my boat instantly when I'd get one bite. Now I just, it's touch screen on my Lorance. So I just touch the screen quick right where I am, and that freezes me where I'm at. The, the important part about that is by the time, let's say it's a four pounder, it comes up, and now with Facebook and everything, I'm like, oh man, I gotta get a picture, and blah, blah, blah. By the time I actually, I've, I've actually with buddies tested this theory. They get back on the trolling motor, and now they're 20 feet, 20, 30, sometimes 20 yards away from where they're actually, where they actually caught that fish. And then they start flipping, and they're like, "Oh, no more!" And they keep moving on. Well, you would be amazed how many times that happens. And then I jump up and I start working myself into a circle back towards that little waypoint or mark for that one. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom! I'll start getting bit, and you can get 40 bass stacked into a into a spot the size of my bass boat. So. For you know sure. that obviously they can't all be right there on the bottom. So <clears throat> I mean it all varies, but you bottom for the most part. For the, it, it varies with yeah. Um, in Daryl, in grass and pads are cloudy days as good as sunny days. What about windy days? Um, well, windy days, windy days yeah. are good in pads. They just suck for the line getting all caught up in the pads everywhere. But. Any any type of grass fish and like the calmest, sunniest better. day, I think is the best. We just we're gonna fish them a little different if it's cloudy or rainy or windy. Um, you know, more reaction type stuff than actually trying to pick apart every inch of that grass, flipping or uh, fishing more vertical. You know. Now, and I have seen sometimes, maybe you can comment on this a little bit, where you get maybe some shallow mats or some shallow vegetation, and the windblown side seems to be, they're more active in that section when yeah. you get into that. I, I will say I'll take advantage of the wind, um, especially in like shallow, thick vegetation, and uh, rather than try to fight it, I'll just, you know, when you're in that really thick grass, you're chopping up stuff with the trolling motor and making a lot of noise. I kind of like fishing like real sloppy stuff when it's windy just because it'll right. push my boat through there at a nice pace where I can still fish and not make any noise. Drop but, the power uh, pole down when you yeah, do and, and uh, I mean, but as far as the bite goes, I'll, I'll take glass calm and sunny over anything. But, uh, you know, just use the conditions to your advantage. If you got some wind blowing through some stuff, you're going to make a bunch of noise going through. Just roll with it, you know. Josh asks, why not a bigger hook than a 3 out? What do we have that at? That was me for the Texas oh, rig. Oh, uh, Yeah, it was a smaller bait. Real that's small the biggest bait. hook I can fit in there. Um, that's basically my rule of thumb. The biggest hook I can fit in a bait, I'll go with. If I could fit a 5 odd in it, I'd fish a 5 odd. Um, that bait, I can only fit a 3 odd in, so that's why I roll a 3 odd. Uh, will a fish hold a 1 ounce or larger jig? What would be too heavy weight? There isn't one, and that's actually funny, Brian, that you bring that up because in practice they'll sure heck hang on to it. I'll tell you that they'll hang on yeah. to it for a minute. I Man, I've caught practice, fish but, on up to 
two and a half ounces is the biggest sinker I've ever flipped. And um, they hung on to it long enough to put a hook in their face. And then, like I said, in Pat's had them in mass or some of them. One yeah, the well, I don't it's think like one ounce ever, is anything to them. You won't ever mean, let it go. You know? I think every crowd had to eat weighs at least a couple ounces probably. Right. The it, density's a little different. And but, as long as you're keeping a little bit of little bit of tension on your rod, too, you're kind of absorbing some of that weight from it. Now, if you drop your rod down, that weight might fall into their mouth and get a little weird. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to let the size of it dictate what i'm going to fish i'm going to let the the stuff i'm fishing dictate what size of weight i'm going to use um how do you thoroughly how do you thoroughly fish an area and when to move to a different spot as can thoroughly fish an area um i mean if you really want to thoroughly fish it you're going to flip like the visual edge of it and then go back through and throw a jig worm on the outside edge of it um and when to move to a different spot i mean if you're talking like tournaments and stuff um if i like know they're there and caught them there or like know where they're gonna be if they're there i should say um like minnetonka i probably don't spend more than 15 minutes on a spot in a tournament at all um yeah if you if you can't if you if you don't go right back to where they are it's so right where they were and catch them i'm, I'm out of there but mind you, mind but, you, that all dictates the term you're fishing, the body of water you're on. Yeah, I guarantee yeah, you, yeah. if his is like anything like mine, I guarantee it's ten times more. His wake out, his screen's littered with waypoints all across that lake. Now, if he's there fishing an elite event or I'm there fishing an open event, we don't possibly know that body of water like yeah. we know Minnetonka. <laughs> so we're more apt to if we got a couple of juicy areas to stick it out in there a little longer and catch our fish because it's mostly about catching yourself five fish every day. Um, and the right ones, uh, where Minnetonka needs to be a, a, a hammer fest every day. You 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 can't. Sit yeah, on for that. yeah. I guess I guess that depends a lot on uh, um how much stuff you got to fish. Basically, as long as I'm semi consistently getting bit, I'll stay there. As soon as you know it it starts to die, I'm gone. I'm not gonna wait for him to turn back on or anything like that. And uh. Oh, we got a few of them. What would you throw in dirty water, one foot or less? Dirty water, well, one foot or less. Anytime you get that shallow frog or top water itself, it's really hard to beat. Um, I don't know if you guys heard that question. The question was, Sorry, what would you throw in a foot or less? Um, as long as the water's warm enough, you know, well, in the fall, it's a little different than spring, but um, as long as you're in the sun, in the 50s or better, a top water's really hard to beat a foot or less. If they're actually a foot For or sure. less, you know, I might say one foot on your depth finder, but really you're in like It'll two feet of water. gobble up a frog you know? in one foot of water. Yeah. Oh, eat it. Top water's killer anytime fish get that shallow. Edwin's asking, when pre-fishing in milfoil, do you leave as soon as you stick one in a bed? Um, I, I I'm going to I'm gonna catch one. I'm going to flip right back to – well, I don't know if people heard that question. When, I said, yeah, when pre-fishing in milfoil, uh, and, and I kind of touched on it a minute ago, do you leave as soon as you stick one in a weed bed? Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to flip in there. I'm going to set the hook on the first bite um, just because I'm angry and haven't had a bite in six hours. Um, I'm going to flip right back to that same spot. If I get a bite, I'm going to shake them off, and then I will not fish that spot till the tournament, right. regardless of whether I caught a couple two-and-a-halves there or two five-pounders or whatever. Um, that's, that's a school in the mill foil. I'm just going to put a waypoint on it, and I'm going to go back there in the tournament. Yeah, I, I might expand it a little bit to see if, you know, if they're spread out or how tight they are, but I'm never setting the hook after the first one. I'm just kind of shaking yeah. it. And I'm, I'm just going to make sure it it's a bass and, and not a pike. Yep, exactly. Um, on dirty lakes, this is Zach Lewis, and on dirty lakes, the milfoil might grow up to five feet. Does the water get too hot that shallow in the summer? Sometimes that surface temp gets to 80 plus degrees. Do you uh, move on and start fishing deep structure? <laughs> grass is going to, grass is going to stay cooler and hold a lot of oxygen. And dirty um, lakes are going to be shallower. Generally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm still going to be fishing that milfoil. That that jig worm's a nasty little bait in that little five foot weed line. Um, and flipping too, flipping. but and generally um, those fish are used to it. They live there. They're they're used. Yeah, to it. It, 
I mean, don't get me wrong. You're still gonna. There's still fish that go out deep on dirty water lakes. Definitely. But um, if, I, if if there's grass in the lake, I'm gonna fish it. Brian asks, is there a way to have the chart running without having the sonar running at the same time? I've heard that sometimes sonar pings spook the fish. I like that. I actually, I agree with that too. I think in shallow water, especially if you're there a long time or it's getting pressured, big tournaments coming up. Uh, I think they do. And on, on my unit, I'm not sure what you're running. I'm running the Lowrance Touch 12s. On those, it's just one button I hit. It just says stop sonar. I just hit that one button. It's right, right there, ready. It, quick. Quick touch of that, and my sonar shuts off, and I, I'm just running my map. So, yes, yes, that is uh, – I always stop sonar if I'm fishing shallow water and I don't feel like I really need it. I, I'm going to do that for sure. And and I run a hydro wave and, and stuff like that to try to try to more get – I don't want to turn them off. I want to turn them on, so whatever I can do in that shallow water. For the deep milfoil, do you use a drop shot or an eco rig? We never really talked about yeah, finesse outside the jig. Um, I definitely use a drop yeah, shot. Yeah, outside outside edge um, stuff. I know some guys will flip a drop shot in the milfoil. Um, I don't really do that much. But, uh, yeah, the deep edge, you can get super finesse out there. A great way to catch them. I, I do drop shot a lot on the outside edge. Questions keep coming in. Sorry, guys. Bear with me. Uh, oh. Milfoil, is it in lakes in the south, Toledo Bend? I think it's more hydrilla. Yeah. Down there. I've never been to Toledo, but. Nah, Milfoil is definitely more of a northern thing just because it handles the cold better than hydrilla. I do see it sometimes in the yeah, south, but I can't tell you where. I, I think Toledo actually does have a little bit of milfoil. It's mostly hydrilla. But mind you, hydrilla is the south version of milfoil to us, so hydrilla holds a lot of bass. Yeah. So a lot of that kind of correlates, and it did when I moved to Chickamauga. A lot of the grass techniques, I went right there and started flipping right away, and nobody really did that. I, I went around and flipped a, a craw tube because that's what we do up here, and, and it worked. I caught big fish, and they'd even school up and stuff like that in little in little deals. So it's kind of relative, but if you can, a lot of times if you have a lot of hydrilla and only a little milfoil, then they'll be in that milfoil. So um, how long is your leader on the jig worm? Um. I try to keep mine just out of the spool on the jig worm. Yeah, um, six foot maybe. A little bit I can trim up a little bit and then retie when I need to. Yeah, realistically you can get by with you know probably a three foot leader. I don't think a fish really ever looks that far past yeah. a bait, but um, just for, for good measure stuff, I'd yeah. run them a little longer and you're going to retie a few times. That way you don't have to re retie a new leader. You can just retie your bait. Um, All right. Uh, what size weight would you use when flipping into submerged weeds, and are you trying to get to the bottom or fishing a certain depth? Uh, we're yeah, we're always bottom. trying to hit the bottom when we drop our sinker through. Matter of fact, it's in. Just real, you want to kind of tell them how you generally? Yeah, flip I, I don't. Support. I don't fish. I don't spend a lot of time. I mean, if I'm out of school and I'm trying to get every last bite I can out of it, I'll probably sit there a little longer with it. But it's basically flip in there, down to the bottom, hop it once or twice, wind it in, do it again. Um, you're, you're looking for a reaction. You're trying to yeah, get a reaction well, once Yeah, I mean, I'm flipping basically half to half to three quarters, 90% of the time in mill foil anyways. Um, Solid weight. As long as you can get through it every time to the bottom. On Tonka, what weight jig do you prefer for flipping? Which Tonka to everyone else is Lake Minnetonka here in Minnesota. What weight jig do you prefer for flipping foil versus what weight bullet weight do you get at the top down where the fish are at? That's a really good question. Yeah, um, depending on uh, a jig, you're going to have to fish a heavier jig to get through the foil the as you would here. a Texas rig. Let's say we're fishing really, really thick stuff. Maybe I'm fishing a three-quarter ounce Texas rig. I'm probably going to have to fish a one-ounce jig in that same grass. Or, uh, you know, if it's a little thinner, maybe a half-ounce Texas rig and a three-quarter ounce jig. Um, but that's a great question. And, 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 Gunner, it is a great question. Another thing, too, is your trailer. Your trailer can slow the fall of the jig. So if you're using something, a big, bulky trailer that has a lot of kick to it, that's going to slow your fall of your jig. And then if you want a faster fall, you're going to want to bump that up. But if you're using just maybe like your traditional chunk style, that's going to fall a lot quicker when you are the size of your jig trailer too. So, Gunner, good question, bud. New to me. 
Oh no. New to Minnesota should be. Okay. Um, uh, I'm now in Minnesota. Only my second year here. Tonka. Busy during, crazy busy during the summer, but super convenient for me to fish. Any tips for keeping the marina owners from yelling at me when I'm fishing their docks? Um, yeah, get out yeah. of the marinas, bro. Get, there's a whole bunch of good stuff to fish. The marinas are great, well, too. But be nice to them. I always talk to them right away, try not to bang their stuff in the marinas a little bit when you get in there. Okay. That's your route? Yeah. I'm going. It's public water. <laughs> fish it. And it's not that way in every state, but I'm I'm I Min- to go Minnesota's there. the only place you're gonna get yelled at for fishing a boat dock, just fish them. They don't own the water. They don't own I mean really the docks on public property, so I don't even know how they really even own the dock, but uh yeah, just fish them, dude. And and but but even more important, you're talking about Minnetonka and it does get really busy out there, but the fishing's phenomenal out there when, when it's busy. It is I like the, it. The it boat traffic makes moving. them bite. I love it. I get right out there in them. Uh, I get that a lot, you know, wherever I go throughout the country, you now people talk about boat traffic and really none of it ever gets as bad as it does. I'm in Tonka for the most part. So that just makes me a stronger angler. And that's one that it just never really bothered me. I'm going to sit out there and fish. And of course you're going to have your, and it goes both ways, but, uh, types of people are going to cut you off and, and, and get right up where you're casting, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, my strategy is to go when I'm in a marine, I'm not going to leave, but I'm going to try to be cordial. And I, I won't want someone hitting a one ounce jig against the side of my boat. So I'm going to try not to do that to them, but I will tell you this, you need to make the cast to catch the fish too. So it's fair game. They chose to put the doctor. It's public dude fishing. Uh, do you throw your jig worm up in the grass and rip it out? Or do you more of a spot cast on the weed edges? You know, sometimes I throw it in there and just let it sit until something picks it up. And then there's a time where, you know, if I feel, I, I like the exposed hook on a jig worm. And that's what it does. It grabs kind of the weeds. And it will sit there for a while. Sometimes I'll, I'll give it a quick jerk and then let it fall straight. And if that doesn't trigger a bite, usually, uh, you know, if you're putting a Senko, I've never met, met many bass that can't stand a Senko being next to them for a long amount of time. So they're going to bite it eventually. You hope they're yep. going to. How do you tell the difference between the types of grass? Uh, for me, I know them all, so I just look at them. I mean, I guess and you you've could, learned though. Yeah, over time, oh yeah, you study over time. You, gotta, you know, every now and then, what I do is is sometimes when I'm fishing grass, I'll take like a DT16 or a deep runner or something. I might not even catch, but I can tear the grass up on that submerged stuff, and I can see what it is. And you, you'll learn, you know, look up coon tail. It looks like a raccoon's tail. It's bright green. It looks like you know your milfoil and just get to know what your grass is and then then you'll know and, and i can can tell you too with your lorance electronics i can tell you what kind of grass like seth that said earlier coontail grows really bunchy from the bottom comes off real bunchy where milfoil is more of a straight strand and then kind of kind of umbrellas at the top so you can tell but you know time on the water and yeah pay attention i mean look them up on the is. internet or i'm sure there's a little book somewhere that's got all the aquatic vegetation and know your grass that's a big deal um i guess you don't have to exactly know what it's called but as long as you know what it is um there's definitely a lot of patterns to be had in that stuff you know for sure if uh you know you go to a certain lake and there's like little milfoil clumps and everything else is hydrilla and every time you throw in a milfoil clump you get bit you know you can run around every time you find a milfoil clump catch one so i mean you definitely want to know the differences between the grass you know i guess you wouldn't have to technically know the exact term for them but as long as you uh, are visually seeing the difference between them, that's that's good enough, I guess. Um, best way to find grass lines if you don't have structure scan, how would appear in normal sonar? Oh, I yeah. Chance. That's Plain easy. You know, get up shallow and go out and just watch your graph. Your graph will start here, and then all of a sudden it will taper down like this and then end. And now you have your grass line. You can kind of figure out what depth that's at. Uh, depending on your hummingbird or the you can set, you know, what depth that that kind of grass is growing. and. And even Minnetonka, it's different. You know, water clarity kind of dictates what, where the weeds and what type oh, yeah. of weeds, where that weed line is going to be. It could be out in 20, 20, 24. I mean, you just don't know. It could it, be in five foot of water. It could be in five foot. So you just kind of, wherever you just get yourself up shallow, use your map to get up shallow, and then just go straight away from it, following those contour lines out, and you'll watch it kind of dip off. And if you go back and look at those screenshots, you might see downscan shots next to the uh, structure scan ones that I took. 
And they're going to look the same on sonar, just with color. So just kind of look at them, them break lines, and, and you'll be on a weed line. Hey, thanks, man. What is your primary top water color? Do you use a red front hook? While is killing them now for the California Delta. What is your primary top water color? I mean, top water is kind of a general term. Um, if we're talking frogs, uh, black, white, black, and a bluegill color is pretty much going to get the work of it for buzz bait. Um, if you're down south, white, black, good and one white, with all, with all the shad, white can be black a really good or white, one, one of the two. Um, I guess in our sort of not really throwing like a black, you know, like walking the dog or popping type bait. White's usually, I mean, I throw bone, but. Pretty Speak much up. the same deal. Yeah, a real red hook on the front. I've, I've done well on that, too. Um, I don't think you're getting any, any more bites on it because of that. Um, it definitely keys them in. You probably hook more fish on the front hook, run a red hook on the front. But uh, I don't think you're going to get too many more bites. Travis asks, how's the New Zealand SV? The SV? I wish I could tell you. Yeah, it felt too, awesome man. when I played with it at ICAST, but I actually haven't got to throw one yet. So... That's the one um, I'm like really excited to get my. Yeah, hands, it's gonna it's hands. gonna be the deal. Um, it's the old zillion frame, which is like the best frame ever. It's coming back now with an SV spool in it. It's gonna be killer. I wish I could tell you more. I just actually haven't got to throw on one yet, but I played with them a little at ICAST. It'll be the deal for sure. Um, Josh Aston, what kind of punching hook? I mean, you can create bites. I I, I went back. I reverted back to a snell knot. First of all, on a straight shank hook, when I'm punching, I really, really like that combo. And uh, I'm kind of, to be honest, I'm kind of caught between, caught between the VMC flipping hook and the Gamagatsu flipping hook. I'm really excited about that uh, Aaron Martin's Gamagatsu hook that's going to be coming out. I'm excited to, to check that out. But as a general rule, I like that VMC. Seth got me on that VMC, and that worked really well hook. for me in Florida. And the Gamagatsu, I don't really like, I like the heavy covered one, but that super heavy cover, that's just, Maybe I don't have as big of a hook set as, say, your Andy Youngs and stuff like that do out there. But uh, uh, so that super heavy is just too much for me, even with braid. Uh, but the Gamagatsu uh, heavy cover is another really, really good, really good straight shank. All right. A lot of guys saying great webinars. We might start wrapping it up. Let's see if there's any more here in the bottom. There are good ones here. Someone asked what your favorite bait was on Minnetonka. My favorite bait? Um... Probably day in and day out, an RTX jig. No, your favorite bay. Your oh, favorite bay? bay? <laughs> well, I mean, it used to be a certain bay, but I haven't caught a bass in that bay for about three years. I ain't going to tell you what it is. But. Uh, we'll side imaging pick out fish in the grass. It's tough. I'm just going to tell you it's tough. You can. You can see bluegills and stuff like that, and every now and yeah, then I no. spot one, but no. I mean, Them fish are in the grass. You ain't, yeah. you ain't going to see them. No, I have had it. I will tell you this. I have had it on my front transducer where I've ran into them so solid into the grass that they actually will split a little bit, and I can't see the bottom like I could on the I actually take that back. Um, we're talking a lot about milfoil. That's what we have up in Minnesota that you will not see fish in the grass. Because of what it does. But when you go to hydrilla lakes and stuff like that where they actually sit like on the outside edge of the grass, then you will be able to see fish on your side imaging um, around the grass. Last question, then we're going to wrap it up. we got to try to keep these. We always go over. We're at 9.15, hour 15. Any, tight, any tips for fishing eelgrass? Have you found that it's a bad grass to fish? They hold insider edges. I love eelgrass. Eelgrass can be really good, especially in river situations and stuff like yeah. that. Um, uh, eelgrass is good. It's good springtime grass, too. Uh, I don't know yeah. if it's a bottom deal or what it is, but. Any, any real yeah, tip. I think swim sand, jigs are killer in, in swim the grass. jigs, um, top water. If you got any like, current around, if you are talking yeah. about river fishing, stuff like that. Well, speed worm comes through. Yeah, pretty good. speed worm's a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard grass to get baits through. Um, so whatever the most we the frog over the top of it's decent. Too. It's generally pretty shallow, so yeah, you get shallow out there and kind sandy, of moving water. It's, it's those fish moving that eel grass pretty good. So yeah. Well, at that, I'm going to thank you all. Please, yeah, please thanks, check out and sign up. We, you can sign up right now for our next one, October, Fall, yeah. fall River Smalley Fishing. That's right. October 12th. So 8 o'clock, same time, 8 o'clock Central. Check it out. We'll be here. We'll be ready to go. Thanks, thanks all for checking us out. See ya.